if you want me to keep it, because I've had a lot of people say, Tim, I'm not giving till after that date, because I don't want to see you bald. All right? So, so anyway, that's the, that, that's the deal. Uh, but anyway, uh, for those of you who are visiting, please forgive us for this foolishness at the outset. That's why we did it right here. Uh, but we're engaged in a uh, building fund drive for what we call Build the Barn. Uh, the pictures are in the foyer. There's brochures on a table in the back. There are pledge cards back there. If you want to get engaged, uh, we have done everything here for the last 26 years debt-free. And we plan on building this building as close to debt-free as we possibly can. And what I mean by close is we might finish construction before all the pledges come in. But all the pledges will be made that covers the debt. So we uh, fully intend to be debt-free by the time that the pledge campaign is over and the building is finished. And so uh, that's what we're attempting to do. In three months, from October to the end of December, we raised $1.12 million in pledges and gifts. So thank you, thank you very, very much for, for making that possible. Thank you for being here today. It is a pleasure to have you, and it is always a great Sunday when Mr. Tim Kepler is with us. Thanks for being here, buddy. Good morning, church. If you're a visitor, we would love to hear from you. If you would, please fill out a visitor's card or a connect card that's in the pew. Drop it in the offering. If you have a prayer request or a change of address, it would be helpful for us to know that. So we can pray about it at our staff meeting. And we're really glad you're here. If there's anything that we can assist with, please let us know. Ladies, in 2019, we have a book club just for you. This is a great way to meet new friends from here at New Hope or to just hang out and have a good time with the ones you already know. We will offer various times, dates, and locations for these once monthly meetings. So sign up today and tell us what your preference is and we'll get a hold of you. Make sure to read that email so you get all the information you need. See what I did there? See you soon. Ladies, Calvin Crest Retreat is right around the corner. The dates this year are April 5th, 6th, and 7th. The special guest speaker is Jennifer Lord. Her topic will be the road less travel. She's gonna encourage us to live and love like Jesus. And with a last name like Lord, she's probably got some pretty good insights. So you can go online today at calvinpress.com and register so you can be sure to get the room and select your roommate that you'd like to have up there. By the way, on Saturday, they're having a scavenger hunt called Find the Chocolate. I'm not gonna miss out on that. I hope you won't either. See you soon. We'll be starting a seven-week Bible study called the Daniel Plan on January the 16th. This promotes a healthy lifestyle in five areas of our life. Our faith, food, fitness, friends, and focus. We'll be meeting every Wednesday at 7 p.m. We'll watch a short video, and then we'll have time for discussion about what we've learned. There's also a Facebook group. And this will be where we can have discussion, sharing, and encouragement for all the people that are participating. What better way to start off 2019 than with a healthy lifestyle? That starts on January the 16th at 7 p.m. If you're attending a Bible study on Wednesday nights or your kids are attending the jam session, then you're welcome to come to our family dinners. That starts at 6.15 and it's just an opportunity for everyone on campus to get together and eat. And since we're doing the Daniel Plan study, there will be options available for those that are participating in that. Hope to see you there. We'll be having our monthly men's breakfast on February the 9th. We start with coffee at 7.30 and then we'll eat at 8. So you're welcome to come along, meet other guys in the church, and eat some delicious breakfast. The next jam session begins January 16th for kids preschool through fourth grade. We will be doing various science experiments to help us learn about the great examples of faith that are in the Bible. All children are welcome, and the class will meet from 7 to 8 p.m. on Wednesday nights for the next seven weeks. Our fifth and sixth graders will continue to meet as well at the same time, 7 to 8 p.m., as they do every week. Come join us. Senior Luncheon Recap and Fun. Hey, Pastor Tim, I think you, you owe a huge apology to those Charger fans out there. 
after last week, you totally disrespected them and saying they don't have a chance. There's no way they can beat the Ravens. Well, they did, and they went out and beat the crap out of them, didn't they? Question is now, when they beat the New England Patriots this week, wow, what's going to happen then? They're going to be serving up a huge plate of crow for you to eat. Go Chargers. Somebody once told me that crow is best eaten while it's warm, all right? So I'm eating my crow today, yes. I went home, watched the second half of that game last week, and I said, uh-oh, I'm in trouble, all right? <laughs> so the Chargers outdid themselves last week, all right? And um, maybe they'll be around one more week, all right? We'll see. We'll, we'll find out. He did say that word, the C word in there, yes, he did. <laughs> You should talk to the chairman of the board about that. All right. <laughs> but anyway, hey, we had a great men's breakfast yesterday. We had 70 men, all right, for bacon and eggs, all right? It was great. It was terrific. Um, we didn't even have a guest speaker. They just got to visit with each other, all right? So we might even do that more often, all right? But uh, working on some good next speakers for next month. So uh, men, hope you'll come and join us. Uh, although it will have a Daniel Plan influence at next month's breakfast. Cardboard. Uh, no, just kidding, just kidding. That's just a joke. Daniel Plan's got great food in it. Uh, hey, we've got 33 folks up at Hume Lake Winter Camp. 29 teenagers and four counselors, all right? I think we have a picture of them, if we'll throw them, some of them anyway. Uh, there's part of our group. Can you all see the tank that they're by? They built that. Last week when they asked for cardboard, for a cardboard sled to enter into a sled race up there. This is what they constructed. That is made out of cardboard. So when I got the picture, I sent Teddy a text back and I said, how did they do in the race? And he said, it ran like a tank. <laughs> It was very heavy. They had to get off and push it down the hill. <laughs> However, he said, everybody up there, when it came down the hill by them, they stood and saluted, all right, as it went by. So uh, it was the most popular one there, though the slowest, all right? Uh, so they are having a grand time, and here's the best news of all. One of our teenagers invited Jesus Christ in their life last night at the service. So that is what it's all about, particularly since we are kicking off this year talking about evangelism. There is our first testimony, all right? One of our young people has invited Jesus Christ into their life this year, and that is exciting. Uh, Carl Hinke, he uh, is on staff here part-time. He's the one who sets up all the rooms. If you're a Bible study leader, you love Carl, all right? Because the room is already always ready and, and, and ready to go for you. And uh, he is not with us this weekend because his dog bit him. Gave him an infection, and he has been in the hospital since midday yesterday. They had to put him on an IV, kept him overnight. I texted him this morning to see how I was doing, and um, he said, I haven't slept at all, but the infection is much improved. They'll let him know in a little while if he's going to lose his nail, all right, uh, because of the infection, and hopefully he'll go home today. Uh, thank you for praying for Andrea Jackson last week. She had a procedure to hopefully uh, prevent future epileptic adult seizures that she been experiencing for years. Uh, I do not have her phone number, so I don't, know what the, I don't know what the results are. I expect to see her in the next service. Continue to pray for Martha Wilson as she recovers from her broken foot. And then Frank Hicks, his memorial service, just a reminder, January 26th at 2 o'clock. Also from our church, Robert Duchesne, his memorial service is at Boyce that same day at 1 o'clock. So would appreciate you remembering to pray for both of those families. And then Dana Orr's mother's service was this past week. So just remember Dana, if you would. Her name was Mary Maxine Whited, and they would appreciate your prayers. I do have sign-up sheets that will be coming around. The top sheet is in connection to the Wednesday night Daniel plan. If you're going to be attending that Bible study, they would love for you to sign up. He wants to have enough material here this Wednesday night. Also determines what room that you will be meeting in. So they would love for you to sign up so they can know how many to expect. And then also uh, underneath that is available for the women who would like to sign up to be part of a book club. I understand you've sent an email out that explains all of that. No, sort of, all right. 
So sign up if you'd like to be part of a book club. My understanding is, correct me, there's going to be multiple book clubs in various parts of the city, and you can join one of those book clubs. And I'm waving at my, my youngest great-grandson up here. All right. I mean, my grandson, my dad's great-grandson. Yeah, I'm, my brain went with my mustache. All right. So, oh, yeah. Not this time, Fawn. All right. So if you want to be part of a book club, uh, sign up and they'll get you all the information you need to know. Can you imagine what they're going to do in a book club? Read, read and read. talk about the books they've read. Okay. All right. So that's what it's all about. So uh, those sign up sheets are going around. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. Wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Gentlemen, would you come please? Would you join with me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, it's, uh, it's great to be your child. And it's great to know that um, we can trust our Father. You, you love us more than we can even imagine. You have plans, you have purposes, and you have provisions for our lives. And Father, we need to make our lives available to all of those. We need to submit to your plans. We need to know your purposes, and we need to rely, depend exclusively upon your provisions. And Father, when we do that, amazing things begin to happen in our lives, even in the most desperate of circumstances. Your plans, your purposes, and your provisions doesn't mean that we won't have trouble in this world. Jesus was very straightforward about that. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. But I love his next statement, but I have overcome the world. And so when we allow Christ to be all that he desires to be in us and through us, then as we go through those seasons of adversity in our life, whether they are health adversities, whether they are financial adversities, whether they, um, they are job-related adversities, whether they are relationship adversities, when we follow your plan, we have confidence in your purposes and we trust in your provisions then you will do in and through us what you did all on your own. We will overcome the world. And so, Father, I trust that we will learn and grow in your plans, your purposes, and your provisions. Father, we trust you with the needs of those who have experienced the absence of someone very important in their life, from a husband to a dad to a sister to a mom. Father, this temporary absence for those who are believers in Jesus Christ, gives us great hope. Death did not have the last word, but life does. And so, Father, I pray that they will experience that kind of joy in the midst of sorrow and that kind of comfort in the season of their grief. Lord, for those who are in the waiting room of um, surgeries, recovering from surgeries, cancer treatment, health challenges, unknown situations that they're waiting for some answers to, May they experience as well as express a peace that passes understanding because they again are having confidence in what you can do in and through and for them. Father, I, uh, I pray for your divine activity to be at full force in this service today. For those of us who are believers, if there are things that are hindering a, a healthy relationship with you, I trust during this prayer. We'll acknowledge it, confess it, deal with it so that you have absolute freedom to work in our midst as we worship in music, as we worship in the giving of the blessings that you have given to us. And Father, as we open your word, I pray that, um, I pray that you have the freedom through these lips to say everything that you want to say unhindered by my own inabilities unhindered by my own willfulness, unhindered by anything that may prevent you from speaking to each of our hearts today. And once you've spoken, may we respond. Thank you, dear Jesus, for being with us today. In Christ's name, amen. What a beautiful name. What a wonderful name. What a powerful name. If we believe that, then it makes it easy for us to surrender all. And when we surrender all, the chains of a frustrating life are broken in our world. Hmm. That's good stuff.
I invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That's where I'll be reading a lengthy passage in just a little while from. So if you want to get ready for that, let me take care of just a couple of other things before uh, I jump into the message. Uh, there are going to be four of us from New Hope that are going to be uh, leaving February 2nd for Ivory Coast, Africa. Going back on our 1040i mission, going back to our adopted village of Neonan, back to another medical mission trip in Duropo. Uh, I'll be taking three rookies with me this year. First time I've had all rookies in about five years. And um, we're excited. One of them's in his service. Stand up. Kira, we yeah, right, right. There's our, there's our 915 representative. All right. Uh, our first high school senior to take with us on a, uh, on a mission trip. Uh, Linda Bropes from our 8 o'clock service is going to be going. And then uh, t- actually we're represented from all services. Teresa Hutchinson, who is normally in our 11 o'clock service, is uh, going with us this year. So uh, please be praying for us. If you sponsor a Neonan student, okay, and you want to send a letter to your student, because you can't mail things there, I will be your mailman, all right? So if you would like to write a letter, you need to have it here by January the 30th, all right? Uh, It's cool to send a picture of yourself to your students so they know what you look like. You have a picture of them. If you don't, it's in the basket out in the foyer, all right? If you have pictures up, pardon me? All of them are gone now? All right. So everybody should have your pictures of the student that you are sponsoring. And if you'd like to send a picture back, include that in the envelope and we'll make sure they get delivered. Sometimes I'm able to play mailman back to the U.S. and bring back a note from one of those students. Sometimes they get it done. Sometimes they don't. All right. They're in a very rigorous school schedule. And uh, depending on how quickly we get those out there before we leave, just determines whether we are able to, uh, to bring them back. So uh, wanted to share that. Also this past Friday night on a personal note, uh, my sister was recognized by Prison Fellowship for her 21 years of service with Prison Fellowship. <laughs> she is now officially retired. I think I shared with you last week, she's now officially old. She is retired Uh, since last Sunday, actually since Friday. Since yesterday, she actually turned a year older. I will not tell you how old she is. That's not a gentlemanly thing to do. She is five years older than I am, and I am 64. I did not tell you her age. She will be in the next service, so if you see her as you leave and as she arrives, certainly congratulate her on, uh, um, on her service to prison fellowship and um, to those on the other side of prison walls that she has spent 21 years investing her life in. She has done a remarkable job. I am exceedingly proud of her. Um, she is not fully retiring. Um, she is going to be going part-time with Welcome Home. So she'll be working with those who are recently released from prison now. And so um, we're excited about that new journey in her life as well. So um, she should be here in the next service. Um, If you'll recall, what's our theme for the year? Evangelism. I won't be preaching every Sunday, all right, for 52 weeks on evangelism, but there will be a sense of outreach and evangelism, I trust, in almost everything that we say and do in the adventure of this year. Uh, But for the month of January, we are going to spend time looking at what this subject is and what this subject is not. And uh, what is it that will prompt you and me, uh, not just me, but you and me, to be engaged in this thing called evangelism. And um, every song today, every single song, the words of those songs fit perfectly into today's message. Um, Last week, we spent a little bit of time looking at what evangelism is not. All right, we looked at five myths of evangelism. Myth number one, evangelism is something I do by myself. That is not true. First of all, as we've talked about, evangelism is simply the sharing of the gospel, and that should not intimidate us. That word gospel, the word gospel simply means what? 
good news. Uh, we find all kinds of ways to share good news. My sister retired. She's finding all kinds of ways to share that good news. She is working with, uh, with Welcome Home. That is good news. Uh, when you're going to have a baby, that is good news. When you're going to have a grandchild, that is good news. When you get good news from a doctor, all right, when you thought you were going to get bad news, that is good news. I had a text this week saying, hey, pray for my husband. He's going to have a lung biopsy. And then I get a biopsy, uh, and then I get a text back that says, hey, the doctor said he doesn't need one. That is good news. And we love sharing that good news. Well, the message of Jesus Christ and the fact that he lived, died, and rose again and the fact that he loves us so much that he did what he didn't have to do. He did what we couldn't do. He paid a debt he did not owe. He paid a debt we never could pay. And he did that for us. And that is good news. And so evangelism is not something that is done by ourselves. For if we are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ because we have become the recipients of Jesus Christ, he lives in us and he does it in us and through us. Not only is it not done, not only is it done in the presence of Jesus Christ in us, so we're not doing it by ourselves or of ourselves, but it's something that I think we need to understand that as a church we do together. That we're engaged in this process together. That we may be setting some time and some services periodically throughout the year to where, hey, we're going to give you a chance to say, hey, I got to visit with my best friend about Jesus Christ this week. He didn't invite Christ in his life yet, but we had a good visit. Would you help pray for me with him? Hey, this week, well, my neighbor asked me, hey, well, where do you go every Sunday morning? I had a chance to tell him, I go to a place called New Hope. Well, why do you go there? I go there because I love God. Now my neighbor wants to come to church with me. I think we need, to, we need to understand we're in this thing together and we need to be encouraged. That's one of the reasons that I wanted you to take the survey. And I think there's still some on a little table in the back. You can go online. I believe it's on the website now. Just tell us your, your, your personal evangelism story about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm going to share some of those, maybe not by name. Okay. I will check with you first if I use your name. Otherwise I will do it anonymously. But hey, somebody in our church, this is their story. And we'll be encouraged by how we've come to know Christ and how others and so many others were involved in that process. Myth number two, a lot of people think that we don't have to speak the gospel, we just have to live it. I'm going to tell you it requires both. It requires living and it requires talking about this relationship we have with Jesus Christ. Our, our words ought to match our behavior. I got to tell you, I'm a little convicted over this today. Um... Several years ago, uh, Shelly and I went to a movie that we were told was really, really good. And about two minutes in the movie, I told Shelly, you are welcome to stay, but I got to get out of this movie. First off, I'd already seen about six people in the theater that I knew. They knew I was a pastor. And the content of the movie in the first five minutes was disgusting. I said, I can't in good conscience sit here. And we quietly got up and walked out. I didn't stand up and say, y'all are going to hell because you're staying in this movie. I, we just <laughs> got up and we quietly walked out. I should have done that last night. I went to the Tim Allen event. I love Tim Allen on TV. I think Last Man Standing is hilarious. I liked them on tool time or whatever it was called. Home improvements. Thank you very much. Love that program. I did not expect a foul mouthed vulgar man on stage. It was very disappointing. We, uh, we walked in and sat down and after 10 minutes of sitting there, couple turned around and said, you're Pastor Roland, aren't you? <laughs> I said, yes. We chit-chatted for a few moments. I said, come visit us. And that was before the evening. 
And I sat there and debated for several minutes about getting up and just quietly walking out. And uh, my excuse was I had 10 people to my right and 10 people to my left I would have to climb over. The good news is that it ended an hour and 10 minutes sooner than it was supposed to. For that, I was very grateful. But you see, our, our conversation and our actions need to match up. We can't just lead people to Christ by the way we live. We sometimes have to use words. Myth number three, evangelism requires special training. No, it doesn't. Don't misunderstand me. Taking a class on learning how to know more about sharing your faith is a wonderful thing to do. Over the, the decades I've been engaged in ministry, there have been all kinds of classes. We've offered them uh, here in this community when Billy Graham's come to town, when Luis Palau's come to town. That, that, that's a different kind of evangelism. That's being prepared for the people who are already up front at the end of a service, and, and you volunteer to be one of those who would be there that would help lead them in a prayer. So that, that's really easy. Okay? But we still want to know what it is that we're supposed to share, and we don't want to share the wrong things. And so we get training for that. There have been other classes like Evangelism Explosion and other discipleship programs, all wonderful. But you don't have to take one single class to share the hope of the reason that Jesus Christ lives in you. The woman at the well never had time to go to one class, and she went packed and changed the course of her community. We have that again and again in the scriptures. I, uh, sometimes those classes can actually intimidate us or give us wrong motives for sharing our faith. I, read, I hope I can remember the story. I did not put it in my notes. I think I pulled it off in the 8 o'clock service. All right. There was a guy who had been a Christian for a long time. He had never shared his faith, and their church was offering an evangelism class. And so he went to it. Well, in that first evangelism class, he was challenged to put something up somewhere that would remind him to share his faith every day with as many people as possible. He was a barber. So when he got to the barber shop the next day, he put a little sign up in the mirror so he would see it as each one. He said, I'm going to share my faith with every one of my customers. First customer that came in that day was a brand new customer. He was about six foot four. He was act handle wide at the shoulders. His hair was down to his shoulders. He had tattoos up both sides of his neck, down both sides of his arms, big heavy chains. This guy was terrifying. And he said, not going to do it with him. In the course of the day, he had a reason for every customer that came in why he couldn't share his faith. And finally, he was so embarrassed that he hadn't kept one commitment that he had made that day. He was praying, God, give me one more opportunity. And about 60 seconds later, here comes a very well-dressed, mild-mannered looking gentleman through the door of his barbershop. And he thought, oh, thank you, Lord. The guy sat down in the chair, and he got him all set, and, and he was going to give him a razor cut, so he got his razor out, and on the, the, uh, uh, the, the razor strop, all right, he was, he was sharpening that razor, and he was getting so excited, and then he got so scared, he wasn't quite sure now how he was going to begin that. So as he sharpened the razor, all they could finally do was look up at the man and say, are you ready to die? <laughs> I, I, I don't recommend that approach, all right? I, it's not one I recommend in sharing your faith. Um, Myth number four is it's, it's, it's best you never mention hell. Uh, folks, sometimes, as I shared last week, sometimes there are some folks who just simply need the hell scared out of them. And sometimes hell is a good thing to bring up. Um, uh, Jesus comes to live within us to change the course of hell on earth in our lives. And Jesus comes to live within us so that he can escort us to heaven when we die. You see, the message is this. If we live independent of God... In this world, then we will live independent of God in eternity. It's that simple. It's not any more complicated than that. Independence of God now is independence of God for all time. And that is hell. Myth number five I'll get around to sharing my faith eventually. There will always be procrastination if you're never willing to take the risk of sharing your faith. So that's what we looked at last week. Today we're going to look at a bit more of a positive side to this. Evangelism is not salesmanship. It is not urging people, pressing people, coercing people, overwhelming people, or subduing people. Evangelism is sharing a story. It's reporting good news and how it's changed your life. There was a little girl one Sunday 
as her family drove home from church and she turned to her mom and said, Mommy, there's something about the preacher's message this morning that I don't understand. The mother said, well, what is that, dear? And the little girl replied, "Uh, Mom, the preacher said that God is bigger than we are. He said that God is so big he can hold the world in his hand. Is that true? The mother replied in the affirmative, yes, dear, it, it, it is true, honey. But mommy, the preacher also said that God comes to live inside each one of us when we believe that Jesus is our Savior. Is that true too? Again, the mother assured the little girl that what the pastor said was true. With a puzzled look on the face of that little girl, she then asked her mom, if God is bigger than us and he lives in us, wouldn't he show through? Exactly correct. If he doesn't show through, maybe we need to rethink, does he live in me? Let's look at a few things that evangelism is today and see if it's showing through. Number one, evangelism is the expression of perfect love. Evangelism is all about love. The love that's God been showing through the world throughout all time. From his creation to how he dealt with the fall to how he chose a nation to represent him in the world to how he sent his son into the world to how he formed the church. The miraculous thing that the church is. Just stop to imagine this thing called the church. The universal body of Christ, the invisible expression, the visible expression of God in a world. Think that the church got started by 12, most of them uneducated men. And over 2,000 years later, the world is still talking about it. It's unbelievable. There has never been a moment when God's love hasn't been present and there never will be. I don't know about you, but sometimes God loves makes me so excited I want to shout about it. I'm amazed by the love that surrounds me I'm, and the continued invitation that God extends to all of humanity that he wants to come in and eat with us and spend time with us and hang out with us. Many of you, if you've been in church very long, you know the passage in Revelation 3.20. It's Jesus talking. And he says, Behold, I stand at a door and knock. I want to come in and eat and have fellowship with you. And that verse is often used in the context of evangelism. And what we need to understand is that is its secondary application. Those words that Jesus spoke... He spoke to a church, to believers in himself who closed the door on the perfect love of Jesus. They only let him in when he was invited. And Jesus said, though I could kick this door down, I stand at the door and I knock. I want to hang out with you. Parents, did you ever have teenagers who closed and locked their bedroom door? You would stand and knock. What kids don't realize is their parents want to spend time with them. They want to hang out with them. Teens, you get to a point in your life you don't want to hang out with your parents. Your parents love you. If they're a good mom and dad, they love you with all their heart. They could kick the door down. They could take the door off. Did that to Brant once, didn't I? (laughs) You could take the door off. But this is perfect love. And Jesus says, I'll stand on the door and I'll keep knocking because I want to spend time with you. This perfect love that God has shown us becomes a compelling love in us. I want us to look at what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. Verse 14, it reads like this. For Christ's love does what? Compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. 
And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but we should live for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, from this moment forward, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. That convicted me as well because I can't look at Tim Allen from a worldly point of view. How should I look at him? Though we once regarded Christ in this way, this is Paul writing about how he once saw Christ. Paul was a very religious Jew and he saw Christ through the tradition, through the blinders of his own tradition. He said, I was looking at him from the wrong perspective. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Let me pause right there. What does it mean to be in Christ? You see, because I'm preaching a message on evangelism doesn't mean that if you're here today and you've never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you could be evangelized before you leave here today. Because I think you're going to hear enough about what it means to be a Christian that you might decide at the end of the sermon, when we pray a prayer, that you might invite Jesus Christ to come live in you. Because what it means to be in Christ, what it means to be a Christian, Christ in you. It's what Christian is, Christ in you. How does that happen? When we come to a point in our life that we recognize we've been independent of God, we've been calling our own shots, that's what it means to be a sinner. So many times we want to define sinner as an adulterer, as a fornicator, as a liar, as a thief. Those are all symptoms. The root of our sinfulness is independence from God. So you've often heard me say from this pulpit, I could preach a sermon and be sinning. Marvin could have ticked me off last week and I could have designed a sermon that to preach to all of you that was right at Marvin. That would be sinful. Because that would be independent of God. So if you've lived your life up to this moment in complete independence from Him, but yet you've heard enough of the story, maybe you've even believed that Jesus is who He said He was all of your life, but you've never invited Him in then at the moment that you invite him in, there's an acknowledgement that I am independent from God. I am a sinner. That Jesus Christ loves me, died for me, rose again for me. And now, Lord Jesus, I want you to come live in me. If you, with faith and honesty, pray that prayer, you are now in Christ. And what happens when I'm in Christ? I become a new creation. I'm not defined by what I was. I'm defined now by who Jesus is. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God. The old things are now replaced with the all things of God. Who did what? Reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. This was written to the church, folks. That means you have a ministry of reconciliation and you have a ministry of reconciliation and you have a ministry of reconciliation and I have a ministry of reconciliation. This is not just the hired guns. This is all of God's children. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Doesn't that sound good? My sins are not counted against me. And he's committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's, what? Yes. Ambassadors. Ambassadors do what? Goodwill. They share goodwill. We are ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to become sin for us so that in him, you and I could become the righteousness of God. Folks, that is good news. That is the perfect love of God. We are to be ambassadors not of goodwill, but of God's will. Not just of good news, but of the best news. Evangelism is not only expression of perfect love, but evangelism is also more than a commandment. Sharing the word of God with others isn't the exclusive job of preachers and pastors. As a part of the great commission that we looked at last week in Matthew 28, 19, evangelism is a calling on all of us as believers. However, it's more than a command. It's an honor, a joy. It is a pleasure. It is important to show God's love. Our actions shout louder than our voices, but we need to use them both. We are living examples of the grace of God and our attitude towards others should impact their lives. Sometimes it seems that we enjoy talking more about an awesome movie 
than God's awesome love. It seems we prefer to have a conversation about a good drink and completely ignore the living water. Why do we spend more time talking about our economic resources than we do the source of eternal life as outlined for us in Hebrews 5, 9? How is it that we can remain silent about the perfect love of God that has been given to us? Jesus affirmed in his own message that you and I are the salt and the light of the earth. It is through us that others can come to experience the enduring love of God. It is you and me who can reach out and touch the lives of neighbors, family, and friends. We can't change the heart of people. God promises to do that. In Ezekiel 36, 26, I will take out their heart of stone and I will play, replace it with a, a moldable soft heart. That's the actual miracle that God does. However, we can do what's in our hands and our hearts by sharing God's perfect love with others and letting that love be expressed in our actions and our words. Number three, evangelism is also a God-given privilege. <clears throat> it isn't a command-driven exercise for me. It's a privilege from the heart. The reason I want everybody to sense the love of God is because I've experienced it. Because I know His... I keep having to feel my face to see if it's me. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's so weird. The reason I want everybody to sense the love of God is because I have personally experienced it. Because I know His love, I want everybody to know it. It's all for love. The same love that Jesus expressed on the cross is the same love that flows in you and in me. If we love our neighbors like we love ourselves as Jesus directed in Mark 12, we should want them to have a relationship with the ultimate source of love. Look around you. People are hurting. The world is searching for earthly answers and earthly pleasures to fill the void that only God can completely. They're looking for all kinds of truth when there's only one truth. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would not what? Perish, be separated from God through all eternity, but have ever lasting life. Who's going to tell them, as Peter described, about the reason for the hope that lives within you? 64 is an interesting age for me. And the reason 64 is an interesting age for me is because it is when it is the age that Ted and Carrie, my in-laws, Chad's grandparents both died. 64. I'm now that age. And both of them who went from great health to earthly death less than six months, they both shared the living hope of Christ in those months. Ted saying, don't you guys dare cry for me. I've lived my life for this moment. It's what I've waited for. Man, I want to face death like that. And I got to be honest, I'm 64 now. I'm not real sure I would do that. It's the vision that I have. It's the purpose that's out there for me. At whatever age it comes. I thought Carrie would be devastated. She wasn't. I wondered what Carrie was going to do next. And she didn't worry. Her comment to me when she was diagnosed with leukemia 30 days after Ted had died, she said, God has answered my question of what are you going to do with me? She said, I knew my role and my purpose in life was to be a helpmate to my husband. God gifted him to teach. He gifted me with hospitality. Our home was a place where my husband taught the word of God to hundreds of people through the years. And I wondered, what's next for me? My purpose is done. And she said, what's next for me is heaven. Wow. Give a reason for the hope that is in you. And folks, that doesn't happen just like that. Just because you get saved doesn't give you that perspective of life. It is the beginning of that perspective. But there has to be the willingness on our part, moment by moment, day by day, to trust the truth of the Scriptures, to be in the Scriptures, to follow the purpose of the Scriptures in our life. That kind of, of, of hope and expression of that hope comes by investing in God. It doesn't happen just when the pressure's on. 
It's just like, just because you choose to lose weight, doesn't mean you lose weight. There's a commitment that's engaged in that process. And so it is in a relationship with Jesus Christ, but it is a commitment that is so filled with love that it's amazing. The, the next thing about evangelism is remember those who invited you to God's banquet table. Evangelism is the direct spark that saved you and me. In my case, I'm grateful to God to those special people that have loved me enough to share God's love with me. If it wasn't for them, I would still be a beggar who was hungry. If it wasn't for them, I'd still be in a spiritual desert, thirsting. I'm grateful for my parents who so were so consistent at home in loving my sister and I. My, my parents were not perfect parents, but they were loving parents. And what my sister and I could both say to you is we knew that they loved God first. And that enabled them to love my sister and I best. I'm grateful for others that God put in my life. My grandparents, grandparents, you have no idea the kind of spiritual influence you can have on your kids. I pent the night a lot at my grandparents' house. And I remember the foods my grandmothers cooked. I remember the lessons Gardening. of and I remember my grandfather McLean sitting down with the Bible when I would be sitting in his lap and he would just read to me the scriptures. You make a difference, but you must choose to. I remember men like Malcolm Fry, he preached my ordination. After I announced my call to preach, which by the way, a, a year from this coming February, will be 50 years I've been preaching. No, 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 no. February the 8th, 1970. We hadn't got into the new sanctuary yet at, at Ashbrook. And I walked forward and publicly acknowledged something I had known for quite some time, but it refused to acknowledge. My dad was one who didn't believe in uh, waiting long and giving you an opportunity to preach. February the 8th, I announced my call. Two weeks later, I preached my first sermon. 14 minutes. <laughs> it's never been that short since. <laughs> but Malcolm Fry was a pastor friend of my dad's who had come to our church five or six years in a row, stayed in my room with me during the time that he was there. He invested his life in me, and when I announced my call to preach, he called me up and said, Tim, you're going to preach our youth camp in Arizona this summer. I was 15 and a half years old. He was so silly. <laughs> and Malcolm continued to provide me opportunities of leadership and ministry and service well beyond my experience, my years, and my abilities. And I think Malcolm wanted to do that because he wanted me to know that you do these things that God provides for you, not out of your own ability or personality, but out of absolute dependence upon God. Other men like Wade Jernigan, who was president of our Bible college and a longtime family friend. I cannot talk about those who were important in my life without mentioning my Sunday school teachers, Martha Wiley, Helen Bronstein, Nancy Little, it's Janet Matson's mom. These people invited me to the banquet table that God prepared in advance for me. Who's going to invite your coworker? Who's going to invite your roommate? Who's going to invite your family member to the banquet table? that we've already experienced. We can all share the power of God for salvation for those who are willing to believe. We can all share His love that endures forever as David wrote in Psalm 118. Let's go out and share this peace that transcends all understanding. Let's go out and share this joy that is unspeakable. Let's go out and share this contentment in spite of the circumstances that I'm in. And Paul wrote that from a prison cell. Let me wrap this up. Right now, we are midst in one of the hottest seasons of the year. Uh, I'm not talking about the weather. The season I'm referring to right now is none other than America's favorite pastime, football. We have to admit that many love to watch 
a first class football game. I, uh, I thought the Clemson Alabama was a pretty first class football game. I will have to admit the Chargers was a pretty first class football game last week. I know for a fact that there are some diehard fans in this congregation. The reason I know that is because about uh, seven of them who are normally in this service were in the eight o'clock service this morning. <laughs> I know because two people snuck out before the sermon was over because the Chargers started at 10 this morning. People will spend hundreds of dollars to be able to attend a pro game. It is nothing for folks to spend all day Saturday, most of the afternoon on Sunday and Monday nights in front of a television rooting on their personal choice of a team or a player. Oh, and then the Super Bowl, one of the nation's most watched programs of the year. When it comes to the sport of football, many are hooked. We love the tackles, the fumbles, the interceptions. We can't wait for the team to break out of the huddle or go no huddle and see what the next play is going to be. As the team nears the line of scrimmage, we anticipate each player to be in the right place, ready to cross the line with determination to at least get another first down, if not a touchdown. It is nothing for us to sit on the edge of our seats or stand or jump up and down during the plays. We scream to the top of our lungs to cheer the players on the field as to encourage their fullest participation. I know of folks who will do that by themselves, yelling at the TV screen in their own living room. And if the opposing team makes a worthy play, we tend to boo with great enthusiasm as well. In between plays, we either speak to surrounding fans about the previous play, or we speculate with one another as to what play the coach might call next. Sometimes we go as far as to think of ourselves as the coach that is leading the team to victory, and we yell play suggestions out from our living room. It is not uncommon for us at times to blurt out maybe some inappropriate words even during a game or voice our opinion of goof plays that cause a loss in yardage. And oh, then there are the referees. They never seem to make a correct call on the field. Most of them need glasses or at least need to read the rule book. No matter where they may hail from, they are never unbiased as they should be, especially if our team is the one that loses the game. What justification do they have in making our hometown boys suffer the loss because of their bad calls? We get so worked up over a few ounces of air wrapped in a pigskin, don't we? We definitely are fans, the great spectators that sit on the bleachers or stand beside the sidelines expecting tremendous wins of the season. We watch players become injured, coaches become angry, and referees become belittled all over an oblong brown ball. And who makes the best use of it to win a game? So let me close with this question. What about the game of life? Are you and I any different when it comes to whether an individual knows how to make the right moves on the field of life? To become a receiver of God's love, forgiveness, and compassion? Do we get concerned about who achieves and who fails in discovering a true relationship with Christ in the end zone of life? Or do we just sit on the sidelines? They're called pews. Watching the world they're lost, pass by and allow their souls to be tackled by satanic forces and therefore struggling to secure the saving grace of the gospel of Jesus. Is the church nothing more than a bunch of spectators or do we understand this is a full participant game where we reach the community around us with the message of God's love? What's the call? If you're here today and you've never invited Christ in your life before, I think as I've talked about evangelism being good news, you've heard enough of it. Why not make this day, the beginning of 2019, the beginning of you becoming the recipient of the perfect love of God? In a closing prayer, why don't you just invite Him into your life? And maybe for the vast majority of the rest of us, God has challenged you that, yes, I want my life to become engaged in sharing this incredible love that I own, that I have with those who are around me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I don't want us to be so consumed about us being involved in evangelism outside the walls of the church that we neglect providing folks the opportunity to get right with you in church 
And so at this very moment, Lord, if there are some who wondered maybe why they were even showing up at church today, they've discovered the reason is, is they needed to get off the sidelines and they needed to become a participant in the love of Christ. And so maybe their prayer is going to be something like this, but they can use their very own words. Lord, I've lived my life in independence of you up till now, but I want to change that. I don't know all there is to know about what this relationship with you, you is, but Lord, I, I, I've celebrated Christmas. I've celebrated Easter. I believe that Jesus is who he said he was, but I've just never, I've left you standing outside the door knocking. I've never opened the door and invited you to come have your rightful place in my life. And so Lord Jesus, I'm inviting you to do that right now. I understand this means my sins will be forgiven. I understand this means you come and live within my life through the journey of the rest of this life and then you will walk with me through the valley of the shadow of death and you will take me to their presence in the place called heaven. Thank you, Lord Jesus, very much for doing that. Lord Jesus, <clears throat> I've been part of your church for a long time. And so maybe some are praying this prayer. Lord, I've been so selfish with your love. I have not looked for opportunities. I've not looked for open doors. I've, I've not wanted to engage in sharing my faith. It's been very personal to me. But Father, I realize I need to share this perfect love with others. As you provide strength and opportunity, I'm ready to follow your leadership in my life. Lord, thank you for hearing both of those prayers. For just a closing moment. So you have your heads continued in a place of prayer, down. If you're here today and you prayed that first prayer, you invited Christ in your life, would you just raise your hand, put it back down. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to do anything. But I just want to thank God that you made an important choice in this service today. Just put your hand up and right back down. Okay? All right. Anyone else? You're here today and you're ready to be more engaged in sharing this good news and this hope that you have. And you're ready to look for those opportunities. And you prayed something similar to that. Would you just raise your hand, put it back down and say, yeah, I'm ready to be engaged. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much for choices made today. Thank you for the new life that was discovered at Hume Lake Christian Camp with our teens this week. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. 